In my videos on the silence of Paul, I made only brief mention of Galatians 1 verse 19, where Paul says of his trip to Jerusalem, I saw none of the other apostles, only James the Lord's brother. A similar text is Corinthians 9 verse 5, where Paul says, Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? These texts are used extensively by historicists when countering the argument from the silence of Paul, and all mythicists must consider them. This level of interest does merit further treatment. Paul uses words that denote sibling relationships very commonly. The word counts do depend on how you break down the categories, but the way I've done it, Paul uses the term brothers and sisters when addressing his audience 62 times. He refers to non-specific church members as brothers and or sisters 20 times. He refers to named church members as brothers 14 times, to non-specific church members as brothers 7 times. He addresses Philemon as brother 3 times, and he refers to non-specific church members as sisters twice. With the two Lord's Brother passages, this adds up to 110 occurrences in the approximately 24,000 words of the seven genuine epistles of Paul. I have listed all of these occurrences in the comments. In almost all of these 110 occurrences, we can tell unambiguously from the context whether Paul is referring to spiritual or physical siblings. There are only two exceptions to this, and I'm sure you can guess which two those are. That leaves 108 examples where we can tell from context whether Paul is referring to spiritual or physical siblings. And in that group of 108 occurrences, there is only one where the context would suggest that he is referring to a physical sibling, and that one is in Romans 16 verse 15, where Paul says, Greet philologist Julia, Marius and his sister, and Olympus and all the Lord's people who are with them. This looks like a real sibling because it refers to a specific person's sibling, rather than the way Paul refers to spiritual siblings as my brothers and sisters, or our brothers and sisters, or other brothers. So in Paul, siblings are overwhelmingly spiritual, not physical. Here are a few of the typical examples of Paul's use of the term as spiritual brothers and sisters, taken from the numerous ones that exist. Corinthians 16.11, no one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. 2 Corinthians 8.23 As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the church and an honour to Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. His most common way of using the term is in addressing his audience. And this is an example, Romans 7, 1. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. So if we take the two brothers of the Lord passages, it's certainly true that they have a similarity to the one passage that refers to a physical sibling, in that a specific person's sibling is mentioned, rather than somebody who is our sibling or my sibling generally, in that he says, I saw none of the other apostles, only James the Lord's brother suggesting that it's something special about James. Then in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? This appears to be categorising different groups of itinerant preachers, those being the other apostles apart from Paul, the Lord's brothers, and a group with one member, Cephas. The Lord's brothers could be the physical brothers of Jesus, but they may rather be another different category of itinerant preacher. Assuming a physical sibship is fair enough for the sister that is specific to Marius, but there is one individual whose siblings generally seem to be spiritual, and that is of course the Lord. We have good reason for believing from Paul that the brotherhood of the church includes Jesus, because both Jesus and the faithful have the same Father, i.e. God the Father. Paul states in Romans 8.14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. 
Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs to God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So we know that faithful are children of the Father. In Romans 15, 5, Paul says, May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is our Father and Jesus' Father, making us all siblings of Jesus. So what Paul meant by the Lord's brothers is a bit ambiguous. I'm sure if he'd anticipated the historicity versus mythicism debate, he'd have been a bit clearer, but he didn't. Mythicists address the Lord's brother question in different ways. Richard Carrier maintains that brothers in this context refers to all members of the church. There is some logic behind this because of Paul's view that both Jesus and the faithful are children of God the Father. The problem is that it makes for a rather strained reading of 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Carrier holds that the apostles and Cephas were also the Lord's brothers, whereas the passage seems to indicate that they were separate groups. If they were all the Lord's brothers, why mention the apostles and Cephas as brothers would have included them? David Fitzgerald takes a different tack. He notes that in Galatians 2.6, where Paul is talking about the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favouritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognised that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So Paul says of James, Cephas and John, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favouritism. They added nothing to my message. Fitzgerald argues that it's unlikely that Paul would have been disdainful like that had he been talking about somebody he believed to be the real brother of Jesus and argues that the Brothers of the Lord section is an interpolation, and Paul never wrote it. Well, maybe, but this runs into the recurrent problem with dismissing things as interpolations. Any inconvenient evidence can be dismissed as an interpolation. Is Fitzgerald's argument from disdain strong enough to justify this? Robert Price argues that the Lord's Brothers was a particular designation of a group of itinerant preachers. This view does not lead to a strained reading of the two texts, but it's not particularly supported by other evidence that a group bearing such a name existed. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Here Paul's listing the roles within the church and the Lord's brothers are not mentioned. But then there's no indication that this list is intended to be comprehensive. So mythicists have different ways of rationalising these texts, but none of their rationalisations are without problems. When taken in isolation, the Lord's brother thing is perhaps a bit marginal, since it's not at all clear what Paul meant. The plainest reading is that Paul meant a physical brother of Jesus, but that reading is not supported by Paul's overwhelming use of sibling relationships to describe spiritual rather than physical siblings. Perhaps more important, though, is the context in which this debate arises. The Lord's brother is the strongest counter to the silence of Paul argument for the non-historicity of Jesus. Now, if this rather marginal argument is the best one against the view that Paul did not believe in a historical Jesus from all of his writings in seven genuine epistles and 24,000 words, it speaks volumes about what he didn't say about a historical Jesus. And that's really very odd under historicity. So the Lord's brother argument is finely balanced, 
But one thing I am confident of is that the ambiguities are such that there is no way that this argument has the power to displace the silence of Paul argument for mythicism, which remains mythicism's strongest argument.